I hope not to steal any of Dr. McKenzie's thunder here. Uh, There's a little change in the program. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is ultrasound angiosome mapping. These are my disclosures. Uh, first of all, the task recommendations regarding uh, PAD, uh, diagnostic testing. First of all, should be accurate, widely accessible, uh, should be inexpensive and easy to perform. Uh, preferably non-invasive by task recommendations, although uh, we have definitely a role for angiography. Uh, it should be allowed to objectively diagnose peripheral arterial disease. It should also be able to quantitatively assess the degree of disease, uh, localize the lesion to specific arterial segments, determine the temporal progression disease, and to dis determine response to therapy. Uh, these are our main testing modalities that we have in the non-invasive laboratory currently. Uh, ankle brachial index, which I would argue is not an, an adequate test for uh, diagnosis uh, or chronic monitoring of peripheral arterial disease. Uh, segmental limb pressures, uh, segmental uh, uh, plethysmography, gets me every time, PBRs. Uh, toe pressures, uh, tro toe brachial index, uh, Doppler velocity waveform analysis, uh, duplex imaging, which we're going to emphasize on in this talk. Uh, color flow Doppler evaluation, skin perfusion pressure, which has really uh, taken uh, an interesting course in, in monitoring patients for chronic or critical limb ischemia in specifically uh, in uh, the wound clinic setting, uh, and then hyperspectral tissue oxygenation or TCOM. Uh, we also, of course, have MRA and CTA. Of course, everybody knows the risks of angiography. Um, I would also ar argue uh, that there are some limitations of angiography, and I think that was pointed out in one of the previous talks. Uh, Multi-level disease actually uh, decreases the likelihood that you're going to actually get flow into the distal extremity and adequately visualize it by angiography. I would also argue that non-selective engagement, depending on how the angiographer performs uh, their test, may limit the actual imaging of the vessel specifically below the knee, and maybe not uh, allow you to make adequate recommendations regarding revascularization. So we're going to talk about duplex ultrasound color flow and Doppler assist. So basically your, your duplex exam or your, your arterial mapping. Um, this is of course completely safe. There's virtually no risk to the patient um, unless you pound them over the head with the, the probe and we don't do that in our lab. Um, it is very cost effective and you know I have to emphasize that this is a very low cost uh, modality and gives us a ton of information. It's completely underutilized. Why? Because it's a gigantic pain in the butt, and that comes later. Um, it can provide most of the essential anatomic information that you need, and it also provides hemodynamic information, so gradient information, uh, possible uh, areas uh, of uh, location of stenosis. Uh, how's your stent doing? How's your graft doing? I mean, it gives you a ton of information. Uh, color flow and Doppler are actually very sensitive to flow states, and I would say even more sensitive, personal preference, uh, as to the flow state head-to-head uh, -head against angiography. I can see flow when an angiogram doesn't necessarily show it, and, and we've seen that in our lab over and over and over again. This is the downside. It's a very lengthy examination, and it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time training your technicians. There is actually a variable skill level to technicians. We have actually sat down with our technicians and, and told them exactly how we want them to do. We actually go into the lab with them. We scan with them. Uh, we're trying to always increase our level of comfort uh, with our technicians. And because you know, you're seeing a limited number of what they're seeing, you really have to have a very high trust level with your technicians and what they're showing you. Um, also, the curl arteries are difficult to image. I will be the first one to admit that it's very, very hard to image around that stupid inguinal ligament. So this is just a case that got me very, very interested in specifically duplex imaging. When you look at this patient, these, of course, are segmental pressures and PVRs. Everything here suggests that this patient is fine. Now, the reason that this is being done is this patient was actually being followed in a wound click for a plantar ulcer. So this was basically a, a, a patient they're working up, is this an ischemic ulcer or not? ABI is less than uh, 1.4, PVR is a normal. I would say or argue that there is a slight blunting of the P, uh, PPG here, but you know, overall this patient doesn't appear to be at risk for critical limb ischemia, correct? Anybody think that they are? No? Okay. Me either. 
What if the skin perfusion pressure was 38? Anybody now think that they're at risk for ischemia? I, I do too. Okay, so the patient wound up going to angiogram. They actually had a focal segmental stenosis within their perineal artery. So this is a patient that had an ischemic ulcer and completely normal standard non-invasive testing. That would have been picked up on duplex scanning. So this patient could have found that very early on in the process uh, with duplex scanning. This is what we used to do with arterial mapping. We could see the large vessels very well. We wanted to look at stents. Where are large occlusions? Okay, I've got a superficial femoral artery occlusion here. It reconstitutes, and then I've got widely patent runoff. No description, no, you know, how, are these vessels calcified? Are they severely stenosed? Are there areas of segmental occlusion? Are there long segment occlusions? They're patent. Okay, and usually that meant the posterior tibial artery was patent, so you had a bypass, or you had the AT was patent, and the perineal wasn't necessarily assessed all that time. So this is the way that I was taught to do it. What we're doing now is mapping, and really trying to take a very detailed approach, trying to recreate an angiogram with ultrasound. And I believe that we have the capability of doing that depending on the technical aspects of the patient. We're also trying to match the angiosome, or try to, to tell the interventional cardiologist or the interventional you know, PV specialist, whether they're a vascular surgeon or radiologist, where are the vessels going, if we can. Um, do the vessels match up or the, the stenoses match up with the angiosome? And obviously that's been talked about and will be talked about more. And this is how we're describing disease. First and foremost, technical quality of the study is of utmost importance and commenting on the lack of technical quality of the study is also of utmost importance. Uh, we uh, diagnose or uh, describe focal stenoses where they are. We try to quantify them, if at all possible. Uh, and uh, we um, comment on the presence or absence of atheromatous changes. Uh, specifically calcification, very uh, significant uh, comment on the calcification, uh, where it is, and how it may uh, limit your access, specifically. Uh, we do a Doppler waveform description at multiple levels of uh, interrogation. Uh, we do a yes-no correlation with the angiome, as I just discussed. And we try to do pre-procedure -pl planning aspects. It, you know, where are these good areas for accessing for uh, um, uh, PV intervention? Uh, we also comment on the anterior communicating artery between the posterior tibia artery and uh, the anterior tibia artery if it's at all uh, present because that can affect the type of intervention that's performed that will be discussed in some of the interventional talks. And I also like to say that we try and comment on what I believe is a hibernating lumen phenomenon. What we've seen on angiography in both an anterior approach and retrograde approach is there's large segments of hibernating lumen and I believe that ultrasound supports that concept. This is a graphic reconstruction that I used uh, using the WIT product made by uh, Phillips. Uh, these are the areas where we're seeing the occlusions at branch points. Um, there often are uh, reconstitutions in the distal portions because of collateralization, and my argument is that there are long portions of hibernating lumen. This is an example of a patient that has a completely occluded posterior tibia artery in the, in the proximal portion. Um, in the mid portion, you can see a large, open, non-calcified, you know, juicy-looking lumen. Don't know what's in there. I, you know, this is not a post-mortem case, but what I can tell you is there's no flow in there. And uh, this patient, when they went to intervention from a retrograde approach, actually uh, had very re e easy reconstitution of their flow. Uh, this patient did have flow into the distal aspects of the PTA. Uh, and here's an example of the, the Doppler waveform. So, out of Dr. Mustafa's paper description of Ginali scoring in, uh, on angiography, uh, we're trying to now do a proof of concept on Ginali scoring uh, below the knee with ultrasonography. And what this means is we're grading inflow and outflow. Uh, occlusion in this type of scoring system is a long segment occlusion, uh, and it, patency is defined by presence of color flow or presence of Doppler. Uh, outflow, obviously, is just the di distal segments if the inflow is the proximal and mid-segments. And the tibiopedial trunk is actually an occlusion of both the PT and, and perineal as far as this uh, grading scale is concerned. Um, this is just an example of how that grading scale um, would be described verbally. 
Uh, this uh, is an example on the right of the anterior tibia artery not being able to be visualized. The uh, posterior tibia artery is patent. The perineal artery is occluded. There's reconstitution of all three vessels in the distal portion. So it simplifies visually uh, for us uh, looking at, you know, how is the inflow and outflow in the lower extremity. Uh, I believe there's a large future for duplex ultrasound mapping. Um, handheld devices at the bedside for specifically for looking for uh, the presence or absence of arterial disease. I believe that arterial disease should be diagnosed much earlier in the process than when your ABI is abnormal. If you take a duplex scan, you look at the carotid, you look at the femoral artery, and you, you know, listen to the heart with it now, which you can do, you know, you don't need a stethoscope anymore. These things weigh as much as a stethoscope. This is the wave, the wave of the future for diagnosing patients. Um, 3D duplex is, is slick. You know, this is allowing um, arterial mapping much easier from a technical standpoint. Uh, and we're starting to use it in our laboratory. Um, I also believe that reconstruction, so you can visually look at this in an angiographic type uh, presentation is, is the next step. And that's my talk.